Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you all for inviting me and being here this morning. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. Now, my title, Future Themes in Australian Geoscience, I think that's rather presumptuous of myself to come here and do that because you're the people creating the future rather than me now. Um, you know, I'm a bit off to the side now, sort of pontificating from the sidelines, but hopefully in this talk you'll get another view from another perspective, you know, out of the hurly-burly a bit now that might be useful to you. So... By way of introduction, we'll look at the big science themes and science challenges now in the 21st century, and then ask the questions, what's special about geoscience in coping with these challenges, and what's special about Australia? And then I'll bring it together, hopefully, with some collaboration stories, and that's basically my message, that collaboration really is the only way forward with what's the science environment we find today. So the buzzwords that we have for science now, nowadays, earth system science, so important, you know, understanding how the whole planet works and the interrelationships and the feedback loops between all those different sciences. And, you know, we hear a lot about big data and big science. So I have a picture there of a drilling vessel, IODP, that's part of big science that Australia and GA is involved in. These whole global networks of scientists are tackling really big questions. And of course, I think the thing that really captures our imagination is the new technologies. You know, it's come so far from when I started <laughs> a few decades ago. You know, there's so much more that we can understand. But also, it's as if there's a deluge of data, which I think is, again, another one of these challenges. So to look first at Earth system science. This is really about the interactions, you know, of the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the ice, the earth, the soils, and of course the life on the earth. And a lot of my career was involved in petroleum systems where you really start to pull apart what are the factors that are controlling where petroleum is found and formed. And then we started to do working on thinking about, well, can we apply this approach, which actually came out of engineering and coastal engineering for that fact, into mineral systems. And, you know, that's now become, you know, one of the key ways that people look at, uh, you know, resource economics is petroleum systems and mineral systems. So this is a very powerful approach to trying to impose order on the data and on the complex natural world. But, of course, it is a really complex world that we're in. And apart from, you know, the atmosphere and the hydrosphere, the other thing we've got to worry about today really is the Twitter sphere. So, you know, science is very much a human activity in a complex political and social environment. And I guess everyone in the room knows that. Uh, so, you know, it's a big challenge. But I think a systems approach really offers a lot, and I've always found, you know, value in applying it. So we know that Earth is complex, dynamic, and an integrated system. And, you know, teasing out all the little feedback loops and interactions are just so important. So how do we do that now? Well, this is where we come to big data and big science. We really need to do it at a global scale. And, you know, it's just so exciting and inspirational, really, now, Big data and, you know, new data with new sensors from new places. The last few weeks we saw the first earthquake, or Mars quake, you know, it's just amazing that rather than just restricted to the one example of Earth, we now have all these other planets and stellar bodies to use as other experiments that have run. But no matter how exciting all that stuff is, I think it's always important to go back to the rocks to test and validate the models that you're, or the systems that you're imposing on the real complex re that reality that's there. And of course, this is a truism and you hear it all the time. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think this is one of the really big challenges for science now is so much of our um, understanding and our conclusions are in these complex models. But how do you communicate that to the non-expert? 
I don't have an answer. And maybe when we come to questions, that's something we can tease out. How do you do that? Because, you know, the general public has a real, uh, I wouldn't say hostility necessarily, but a scepticism about models. You know, they're familiar with economic models and how often <laughs> they don't work. So uh, I think that is a real challenge. But, you know, we have made real strides. And, you know, when I think of where geology was when I started in it. We've come so far from that static cartoon of the subsurface, really understanding it way down deeper and at much finer scales, recognising it's a dynamic system and, you know, moving towards a 4D understanding of processes. And, of course, many of you here in the room are involved in just that sort of work. So the science challenges. There's many of them, of course, but I think they can be summed up by saying we're living on this dynamic and warming Earth with more than 7 billion people in the Anthropocene. You know, it's a welcome to the Anthropocene. It's, a, <laughs> it's coming at us very fast. And it's about providing the food, the energy, uh, the water in particular, and other resources in an environmentally sustainable and socially equitable way. So it's not just about rocks, it's really about rocks and people and how we can get that to work. So I think it's a great irony that just as we're starting to understand these earth systems and all the intricate feedback loops, we recognise that we've given the poor old earth system a big nudge in a direction we may not necessarily like with the emission of CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, we've really got to come to grips with how the Earth systems work and get better at prediction and understanding because really we may have to go to plan B, which is geoengineering. Carbon capture and storage is obviously part of that, but there's other schemes out there. So the science has to be really good, understanding the, insert the uncertainties and the risks, but more importantly, the science has to be communicated to the general population so that if these options have to be drawn upon, that people are informed and can make the decision. I'm glad it's your job, not mine. <laughs> but we found out this summer that Australia was in the purple and not in a good way. So welcome to the Anthropocene. And I've been dealing with these problems for decades. And it does wear you down, indeed. And what you find is there's sort of a balance between inertia and adaptation. And even in your feelings, a balance or, you know, a conflict between hope and despair. And I think many, you know, scientists and general people in the population feel that hope and despair. And we see adaptation moving ahead, and we also see inertia that looks as it will never shift. But in all these issues, the critical question is often, certainly it's how is the system working and what are the feedbacks, but really one of the real key questions is what is the rate of change? You know, how fast can you shift the Australian car fleet from petrol to electric? How fast can the oceans buffer against the CO2? We've got to get answers to these sort of questions, and it's not just geological systems, it's social systems. So this brings me to my next part of the talk, which is, what's special about geoscience? Are we the time lords? I think this is where we've got to inject ourselves more overtly into the conversation with the perspective that we get from deep time. So much of what we see in the Twitter sphere and elsewhere is on the news cycle, which is three minutes, lucky if it's three days. Uh, quarterly financial reporting of three months is the beat of much of the world. The election cycle, we know so well, we're in the midst of it right now, three years. A generation, 30 years. Nation states, very lucky if they last long, longer than 300 years. Civilizations, also lucky if they last longer than 3,000 years, though some have. 
but we're coming from a perspective of billions of years. Can we give, you know, can we put into these science challenges some of this perspective? I think we can, and we need to recognise our value. So again, what's special about geoscience? Well, we have deep time and a long and rich archive of environmental change that we can talk knowledgeably about. But also, we operate on many scales, from the single storm event that you might see in your sedimentary sequence with your hummocky cross bedding. <laughs> I don't know if anyone still <laughs> is a sedimentologist. <laughs> to, you know, the whole pattern over billions of years. And again, the scales, from the nano scale right to the planetary. So we do have a skill set when we put all our geoscience disciplines together, which can grapple with this holistic problems at the global scale. And we really should you know, take that as our mission, I think. Next part of the talk, what's special about Australia? Well, you can see it there on the map, the view from space. Australia sits in its ocean hemisphere, the wide brown land there, down below all those nice green bits above us. <laughs> but it's in a special place, and because of that, we've got special responsibilities. You know, most of Australia is, in fact, offshore, and we are a key player in science in Antarctica and in the Southern Ocean, which is really major drivers of the climate system. So I think you know, that should be a front and centre of one of the missions of Australian geoscience. Uh, and I'll return to Antarctica at the end of my talk. Of course, the other thing that we have and why Australia is special, but not unique, is that minerals and energy are such a big part of our economy. And indeed, back in the midst of time, that's why our parent organisation, BMR, Bureau of Mineral Resources, was initiated because, you know, minerals and energy have been so much part of the Australian economy, and they still are. Uh, you can see there that iron ore brings in a lot of money, so does coal, LNG increasingly important. You know, up to about 8% of Australia's GDP is from minerals and energy. But we recognise that, you know, the whole energy mix is changing. So how does that look for us in the future in Australia? Well, perhaps an energy mix for the Anthropocene is you still need a bit of fossil fuel there, I believe, for several decades yet, particularly LNG or gas, uh, which is less of a carbon impost than coal. But then the whole thing about renewable energy, you know, this ANU is looking at this idea of exporting electricity into Asia. And then the whole thing about electric cars and the, the requirement for lithium and other critical commodities. And again, Australia's wealth of mineral resources, which you people are the, the key knowledge holders of, will become important. So, you know, you can paint a hopeful future but I want to step back to the Pleistocene and do more than just have the routine acknowledgement and recognise that the really thing that is special about Australia is the 60,000 or if it's 40,000, it's a hell of a long time occupation here and the continuous cultures which have been through many perturbations of the climate, as you can see in that top graph. So, you know, these cultures have been through these incredible environmental changes and collapses. No doubt there's something there that we should access and be aware of. So that's an important part of collaboration. I've been really pleased to see the new things in the GA foyer, acknowledging, you know, where we are and who we are, which is great. And I'll just have a couple of other examples on this theme. I think I've mentioned this before in this room, but I love this paper, which is about the dinosaur footprints up in the Broome sandstone on the north coast, northwest coast of Australia. And it puts side by side the traditional stories of how the dinosaur footprints came there versus the detailed and rather boring sedimentology. 
And it was, it's a beautiful story if you read that paper of how the integration of those two things came together. You know, I think meeting these science and societal challenges is all about finding common ground, really. And I think your sister organisation, the uh, BOM, does really well. I love those uh, uh, Indigenous calendars that they have on their website. Uh, and now the Darwell people, they're a little bit to the north of us, but I think, you know, their calendar is still important, still relevant here. So now is the time when, if you're a qual, you need to be out seeking a mate. Uh, that may not be that relevant to some of us, but I think that last <laughs> thing... <laughs> though, who's a pretty boy then? Isn't he lovely, that qual? Um, but um, the last point is, I think myself and many others did make the trek to the coast over the Easter break. So you see, all sitting here, we're still following these ancient rhythms and patterns. We need to recognise where we are and who we are. So I'll just leave that one there, but good on the bomb. So that brings us to collaboration. And I've got a couple of collaboration stories. The first one is about conventional and unconventional gas though I know people don't like that terminology. And so this is a bit of a story about me and the oil industry. When I joined the oil industry, you know, you're only after conventional oil and gas, which would be hydrostatically contained in a structure and you'd put a hole in and it'd bubble up to the surface and away you'd go. But it was often a deep conflict between the geologist and the engineer, because the geologist wanted to drill the hole with not much pressure going into the formation from the mud, wanted it so that the hydrocarbons that might be in the porous reservoir you went through could actually seep into the well and come up and you could actually see that you'd hit oil or gas. But the engineer wanted to drill a straight, cheap and quick hole, and particularly a safe hole. And really, that's, that was important, safety first. And because of that, you tend to want to weight up the mud so you actually push the hydrocarbons away from the well bore and you just fill the whole thing with the mud you were pumping down and never saw the oil and gas. And I'm sure we thought there were oil and gas fines that were bypassed and missed because of the dam engineers. But there's an example that comes from this industry of really a very successful and deep collaboration with the geoscience and the engineering, which takes decades. And this is what happened in the US with the development of the shale gas revolution. And it was all about understanding the rocks and developing the new technologies. And I really think I'd have to admit that the engineers led the way with horizontal drilling and hydrologic fracturing. And what that meant was that you could go down the resource pyramid and contact and extract vast more volumes of hydrocarbons. So that had, has had a really big impact. So collaboration can give you know, really big positive and negative impacts. So in the US example, rather than running out of oil and gas, they're actually now almost self-sufficient for oil and gas and indeed going to be our competitors in the LNG market. It's just turned around because of this technology that's developed. Now, that has been a good thing. Actually, the CO2 emissions in America in recent years have gone down. I don't know where they're tracking right now because gas became so plentiful and cheap, it started to replace coal in power generation. And the other thing is, it's been allowing the US foreign policy to shift because they're no longer, you know, so dependent on Middle East oil. And are we seeing the geopolitical impact of that? I note, talking again of the Twitter sphere, that we're seeing oil sanctions being used or talking about, spoken about more aggressively with Venezuela and Iran. Whether that would have happened when the US was still so dependent on importing oil, I don't know. So this one is an example of a collaboration that can have far-reaching effects. And I guess when you really get into the nitty-gritty of how this one worked, it, was, it takes decades. 
and it takes continually iterating and tinkering and eventually getting there. So what does unconventional gas mean in Australia? Most of what we're looking at is in the coal seam gas, which is in, often in shallower reservoirs. And as you can see from that cartoon, I'm still in the cartoon age, I'm afraid, uh, the footprint of coal seam gas is going to be much bigger than the footprint of a conventional gas or oil prospect. And so that means that you know, the, the impact and what you can see on the land is more, uh, possibly the impact in the subsurface is more. So science to the rescue, and there's been terrific work done here and elsewhere across Australia about coming to grips as we bring in a whole new industry, LNG source from coal seam gas. And this is just an example from some of the bioregional assessments where you're looking at the complex stratigraphy through the Great Artesian Basin or the Aramanga Basin and then how all those wells will work. But you know as geologists that the complexity and heterogeneity of a rock is quite different from the, the model or the cartoon of what's happening in the subsurface. So often a key question is, what question are you trying to answer and to what degrees of uncertainty are you comfortable with? But, you know, science can find a way and you can create a model of the subsurface and then actually see, you know, as you pump things out, does it behave as you expected? But the complexity in the subsurface is nothing compared to the complexity above ground once you come up. So, again, you know, science is a human activity. It needs to communicate to the whole society. And it's all about can we build common ground, can we have effective collaborations which bring the geoscience knowledge, the engineering knowledge, the environmental knowledge into the social and political sphere. It's a big challenge. Oh, I'm saying is it's a challenge. I don't think I have any answers, but I'm clean to have a conversation when we get to the end. So collaboration, that's my message today. So how good is Australia at collaboration? Ah! I used to, when I was here, I used to occasionally attend a thing called the Coordinating Committee for Innovation. I think the title tells you all. <laughs> but anyway, we're talking now about collaboration between researchers and industry. And back in uh, nearly a decade ago in that bottom of the pack thing from the Fin Review, Australia was very bad at that. And I thought, surely it can't still be like that because we've all tried so hard and I know the Department of Industry really has. But then I pulled out the OECD report from 2017 and it's, I think it's, it might even be worse. So, I think this is one of our biggest challenges, to get our act together, to get these really effective collaborations. So I've got another collaboration story, and this is really ancient history, this one. Way back last century, when we did the paleogeographic maps. Now, this is in the era when your new technology and, you know, the best bit of kit you had on your desk was your set of 72 Derwent Lakeland coloured pencils. <laughs> and I still have mine. They were beautiful. And, you know, we were out to make views of the whole continent through 70 time slices back to the Cambrian. And I think one of the great step forward was we very strictly separated our data map from our interpreted paleogeography map. We'd make our map and we'd colour it up with our coloured pencils. And number 35, you'd always run out of number 35, which was the grass green colour, which was the coastal environment. You know, most things ended up in the coastal environment. Uh, and so you'd colour up your map and then you'd need to send it to your sponsors and your other uh, collaborators. And I think this was, a, this was a collaboration that really hummed. And, you know, again, I feel presumptuous talking about this here because I know there's been many other collaborations out of this organisation that have been effective. In fact, they'd have to be, otherwise you wouldn't all still be sitting here. But 
with the uh, perspective of a couple of decades gone by, I want to bring a few messages from this one. So we had industry on board, and by the end of it, we had almost every company in Australia, big and small, minerals and petroleum, plus a lot of overseas companies. And they paid a bit of money to be part of the consortium, so they had skin in the game. They'd send people every six months for sponsors' meetings, and we'd have a big debate. The universities were very much involved, and particularly the state governments. But to me, um, the real key was confronting the collaborators with the map. I'd come to BMR from the oil industry, and it was quite a shock. I found government ambiguous and convoluted in comparison, and things happened slowly. But this was one place where they did sort of happen rather quickly, because you'd colour up your map and you'd send it off, and as soon as you confront someone with the map, they'd quickly tell you where they had a bit of information or where they thought you were wrong. And one thing I'd like to explore in the conversation after I finish talking is, are there analogues of this sort of thing now? Like, is the data cube like those old maps? Or can we make the models like their old maps, sort of exposing our interpretation and our data to a big community of collaborators. And are we probably already doing it? Uh, I'll tell a joke. I've got time to tell a joke. Um, I've got there about the rapid input from the, uh, the mapping. But in those days, you would write your covering letter out in longhand, and remember this, and you would take it down to the typing pool and they'd type it out. And of course, you would never be, wouldn't be like today where you'd send a PDF off to your colleague in GSWA. No, every communication had to go from the director of the BMR to the director of the Geological Survey of Western Australia. And so all these letters would be typed in the typing pool and then they'd go up to the executive suite. And so the real value adding that happened in the executive suite, sorry James, would be that they'd strike through director of GSWA and write Joe. But that's important. <laughs> anyway, but we actually did get a lot of buy-in. So I'd really like to talk to you and hear your stories if you see any analogues in what's happening now. And my last point is about time control and paleontologists. Are there any paleontologists in the audience? Oh, yes. <laughs> Tegan. <laughs> well, I thought back and really, you know, time control was absolutely crucial because you wanted to be making the map of the you know, the properly defined time slice, and it all depended on, you know, what bugs you had in there. And when you looked at it, there were more paleontologists fiddling with the time scale than there were people pulling all the data together and colouring up maps. And they were, they truly were an old and ornery bunch, weren't they, Chris? <laughs> But they were, they were the necessary interoperability overhead, you know, because you can't start in this process of isolating the data from the interpretation unless you've done your housekeeping and agreed on your data standards and your dictionaries and your, you know, that all that boring housekeeping stuff is absolutely essential. And looking back from the perspective of several decades now, it would have all fallen over unless those cranky old guys were there making <laughs> Andrew knows who I'm talking about, making, <laughs> making sure that we had the right time zone. And you know, and sometimes they would capture the sponsors' meeting and debate where was the dingo didium Jurassicum zone on the northwest shelf and everyone's eyes would glaze over. But you know, really important. So, you know, often it seems like an overhead, but boy, it is important. Right. Now, to conclude, I'd like to go to Iceland. So Iceland, of course, is the place that keeps on giving to geology. When the guys with the beards and the long boats turned up there, they saw the volcano. Well, they didn't know it was a volcano, but they thought the mountain looked like the profile of their shield. So the original shield volcanoes there in Iceland. And of course, as we've come to understand plate tectonics, it's a wonderful natural laboratory there on the mid-ocean ridge. 
and of course it's a great example of using uh, geothermal energy. But I'm going back further to the sagas. And this is a little gem from the sagas which said that the wisest human who ever lived was said to have choked to death on his own knowledge for want of good questions to draw it out of him. <laughs> and really, I think this is one of the key skills to learn, the good questions, that you can get the knowledge from the other experts, that you ask the right question, rather than being the cranky old paleontologist who knows so much. You've got to ask the right questions, so you really can extract and use the deep expertise that others would have. And when you're the expert and someone asks you one of these really good questions, because we know it, because it makes you really question the assumptions and the orthodox approach you've been using perhaps for decades. So I would think that would be one of the key skills to develop. So thank you for your attention. And I wish you every success in creating the future of Australia's geoscience. I'm relying on you. Thank you.